So if my calculation is right, this is uh, sermon number (coughs) four-ish, unless you count the three every Sunday. So this is the fourth sermon. We're new to each other, right? And there are folks who are first-time visitors today, so glad that y'all are here today. And there are folks who are watching online. And so what I want to tell all of you today, (coughs) new or known each other a month, (laughs) a month, I don't usually do what I'm about to do in worship. Not usually. I'm going to sing. I'm going to sing. Y'all have heard me sing before, right? I got some of my Paragold family here today. I control the mute button on my mic pack. Not because I don't trust the good folks in the sound booth. Just I just don't want you to have to listen to me to sing. That's not that I can't sing. <clears throat> I mean, I was in the children's choir. My dad was, was a music director. I was in youth choir. I was even in a chancel choir or two. It's not that I can't sing. It's just that people sing better than me. Like choirs and praise bands and people off the street. (laughs) Everybody. But I'm going to sing this morning a little chorus. And I want you to sing it if you know it. And you know it. Because we have sung it for centuries. It goes like this. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. That wasn't too bad, was it? Ernest, did I do okay? Was it okay? <clears throat> I, I promise I won't do that every Sunday. I won't do that every Sunday. Here's, <clears throat> here's my problem with that chorus. I'm not sure when I first started following Jesus. Now, I have friends who could tell me exactly the moment in time when Jesus grabbed hold of their heart and they decided to follow Jesus. I I have friends like that. They can tell me exactly when, where, how, circumstances, everything. I can also tell you that us United Methodists talk about salvation more as as a journey. It begins before we're even born. God has already claimed us. We call that prevenient grace. You've heard that word before, right? Prevenient grace. The grace that comes before we know who we are. That's the reason we baptize babies and grace that continues on and until we're with God forever. So I'm not exactly sure when I started following Jesus. I'm not sure when. If you're here on our first Sunday back on New Year's Day, and if you weren't here, I'll give you a pass. It was New Year's Day. I mean, I get it, right? But if you were here that day, you heard me tell the story of part of my calling is that when I was five years old, I was in Miss Nancy's Sunday school class. Miss Nancy taught Jesus when he was in the first grade. I mean, (laughs) she'd been around a long time. And she taught the lesson, the exact lesson that Pastor Jen read for us just a few moments ago about Jesus walking up the shoreline, calling disciples, and they dropping everything and following him. I got home, and my dad said, what did you learn in Sunday school? Because I knew he'd ask it. He's five years old. I says, Dad, I learned about following Jesus. And I thought to myself, Dad, I want to be a preacher one day. Was it then that I started following Jesus? Maybe a better question for me and for us today is when did I get serious about following Jesus? Let me ask that. When did you get serious 
about following Jesus. Let me push you just a little bit farther. Have you gotten serious about following Jesus? A few weeks back when I was unloading uh, my boxes for my office, uh, by the way, your previous pastor had more books than I'd ever seen. All this bookshelf, I have to buy doodads to fill up some of the bookshelves. I don't have as many books as, as Andrew did. That's okay. <clears throat> but I ran across this book that I had bought when I was pastor and shared in Arkansas in 2011. I always write where I was when I buy the book in the, in the opening pages. And it's a book by a guy pastor named Kyle Eidelman, and the book's title is Not a Fan. The premise of the book is simply that there is a difference between a fan and a follower. Are y'all with me? There's a big difference between a fan and a follower. Now, <clears throat> I was warned not to, uh, not to say this in the first week of being your pastor to, to give it a little bit of time. But I think it's okay now. We trust each other, right? I am an unashamed Atlanta Braves fan. Am I wrong? Unashamed. I don't mind telling you that I chair for the Atlanta Braves. In northeast Arkansas, when I pastored in Paragold, I got all kinds of crazy about that. They're Cardinal fans up there, you know. Y'all might be Cardinal fans too. I don't know. Are there any Braves fans here besides me? Really? I'm an Atlanta Braves fan because Ted Turner put them on television, right? So we had a flag that flew at our house in, uh, in Little Rock when I was pastor at St. Paul. You know, I met this church in Little Rock. <clears throat> And my mail carrier came one day, and he saw the flag fly, and he said, uh, John, he knew my name. <laughs> he delivered my mail. I mean, he knew my name. <clears throat> he said, uh, how big a fan are you? And I said, I've been following the Braves all my life. I cheered for people like Biff Pokoroba, Jerry Royster, Claudel Washington, Bob Horner, it gets better. <laughs> it gets better. Dale Murphy. <laughs> Bruce Benedict. <laughs> he says, man, you are a fan. My mother used to say, John, if you would spend a fraction of the time on your studies that you spend on baseball statistics, you'll be, you would be brilliant. It's the last time she called me brilliant. <laughs> Go back with me to this idea of being a fan or being a follower. And let's take a closer look at the lesson that Pastor Jan read for us just a few moments ago from, from, uh, from the gospel lesson. <clears throat> we know <clears throat> Matthew tells us, Mark tells us, Luke tells us, John tells us. We know that Jesus was baptized. Remember, we thought about that last week. As he comes up out of the water, the heavens are opened. And God says, this is my son, the beloved. With him I'm well pleased. As soon as that is done, the Holy Spirit whisks Jesus out to the wilderness, where for 40 days and 40 nights he does not eat, he does not, he does not uh, drink. And at the end of those 40 days, the devil comes and tempts him to be someone that he is not, to do something that he should not do, Right? And all the Gospels agree that when that time was over, Jesus' earthly ministry began. And his first act in ministry was to walk by the Sea of Galilee one day, <clears throat> and he saw two brothers. One's name, Simon, later we know him as Peter, and his brother Andrew, and they were working at the sea on the nets, fishing. And Jesus called out to them, and he says, Come, follow me. And the Bible says, immediately, they dropped their nets, and they followed him. So with Andrew and Simon Peter in tow, they walk a little bit farther at the sea line, at the seashore, and there is uh, James and John and their dad, Zebedee, in the boat, 
mending the nets because if you fish, you have to mend the nets from time to time, right? You got to do that. <clears throat> and Jesus calls out to James and John and says, drop all that and follow me. And the Bible says <clears throat> that they did exactly that. You know, <laughs> I, I got to be honest here. <clears throat> There's a part of me that kind of wonders about that story. I wonder what it was like for old Zebedee. <clears throat> he was so proud when his boy says, Hey, Dad, we want to do what you do. We want to go into the family business. The paint on the sign on the pier that read Zebedee and Sons Fishing Company was barely dry when Jesus walked by. And they dropped him. And they followed Jesus. <clears throat> the Bible's clear. It says three things about the first disciples. One is that they had families. Moms and dads. Brothers. Right? The second thing that the Bible tells us is they had jobs. They were fishermen. The third thing the Bible tells us is that they followed Jesus immediately. But back to Zebedee. <clears throat> Can you imagine the dinner table that night? Set for four. Mr. and Mrs. Zebedee and the two boys, James and John. Can you imagine? And Mrs. Zebedee looks at her husband and says, Where are my boys? <laughs> You're not going to believe what happened today. This guy came by, some preacher, and they followed him. I wonder, could I do that? Now, I know easily now I could do that, right? <clears throat> I mean, that's, that's what I do. I follow Jesus. But if I was a fisherman, or an electrician, or a student, or whatever I was doing... And Jesus came by one day and said, drop all that and follow me. Could I? Would I? Would you? That's tough. What I, what I do know <clears throat> is I would love to spend three years with Jesus. Right? I mean, can you imagine having breakfast, lunch, and supper with Jesus every day? Can you imagine <clears throat> not only hearing what he said publicly, how he taught with power and authority, how you would have been there when he preached the Sermon on the Mountain? Can you imagine all that? I'm going to power. But could you also imagine the private conversations that Jesus would have had with his disciples where he unpacked all this and he taught all this? Could you imagine following Jesus where he, he, you watched people uh, be healed. A man's had a withered hand and all of a sudden it's, it's whole again. A woman who couldn't stand up straight is standing up straight again. A man who was blind since birth is seeing. And I'm not going to say pastor's seeing again because he didn't see in the first place, right? He's blind since birth. Can you imagine seeing and hearing all that? That would have been great for me to do. And for you today, <clears throat> there is a group of folks who followed Jesus around. You remember? <clears throat> the Bible calls them the crowds. You remember that? The crowds followed Jesus around, right? The crowds were there when, when there was nothing but some loaves and some fish, and there's not nearly enough, and Jesus said, you give them something to eat. The crowd was there, and they got fed that day, right? <clears throat> they followed Jesus around. They went from this place to that place. They heard him teach. They saw the miracles, too, like the disciples. But when it got bad, what happened to them? They went away, right? They went home. They weren't followers of Jesus. They were fans <coughs> of Jesus. Holly Blair, you need to call <coughs> Jamie Cook today and tell her I told this story about her husband, Luke. Okay? So, <coughs> my friend Luke Cook, who's a Cardinals fan, uh, 
Anyway, he's a Cardinals fan. <laughs> and we went to Atlanta one year in October. The Atlanta Braves were nowhere near the playoffs. They were terrible that year, right? Tickets were almost free. There was hardly anything in the concession stands. You went to the stadium store, they were sold out. I mean, it was it was bad. The Braves were bad. This guy came down and sat beside me <clears throat> on the other side of, of me. Luke was on one side, and this guy was the other. He was wearing a Cardinals jersey. He turned to me after an inning, and he says, Where is everybody? And I said, <clears throat> Friend, your team's in the playoffs. <laughs> Mine's nowhere near the playoffs. We hadn't seen the playoffs since maybe April or May. And it was then that I realized I wasn't just a fan of the Atlanta Braves. I was a follower of the Atlanta Braves. I want to challenge you today. Can I do that? I want to challenge you to follow Jesus <clears throat> as closely as you can. Close enough that you could reach out and touch the hem of his garment. Close enough that you could hear the flip and the flop and the flip and the flop of his sandals as he walks the streets of Capernaum and Galilee and eventually places like Jerusalem. I want you to follow Jesus. Amen? Are you with me? See, I still say that. Are you with me? We're asking you to hit a reset button <clears throat> on our church life. We talked about that two weeks ago. To rejoice always, give thanks in all circumstances, to pray without ceasing. Last week, we thought about baptism and what baptism means, and we thought about Jesus' baptism, and we're thinking about our baptism and resetting our spiritual lives. <clears throat> Today, I want to ask you, to reset your disciples' lives. And I want to make a confession to you. Are you ready? I was a district superintendent <clears throat> for three and a half years. Y'all know that, right? I had a very bad spiritual life as a district superintendent. I didn't mean to. But I had been used to preaching a sermon every week, three sermons a week, three Bible studies that I taught. And all of a sudden, I'm caught up in administration and in meetings and, and all this sort of things. And I felt it coming on. I know you're thinking out there, what kind of a bishop sent this preacher to us who didn't have a spiritual life, right? <laughs> I want you to know I got it back, amen? I got it back. Thank God I got it back. Last year, I found an app on my phone, and I and I it, it you read through the Bible in an entire year. Oh man, this is it for me. I could listen to it, I could read it, I could study it every day, and I did. In January, and in February, and in March, and then I stopped. I got behind. All of a sudden, I was a day behind, and then I was a week behind, and then I was a month behind, and then I was four months behind. And I know you're thinking, what kind of a bishop sent this guy to be our pastor? I'm asking you to do what I have done. I've reset my discipleship life. I'm going to follow Jesus as closely as I can in 23. Amen? And if you need help with that, we're here to help you. We have all kinds of classes, from our youngest kid to our oldest adult. We have classes. Sometimes we call those Sunday school classes. Sometimes we call those small groups. We have, uh, we have things for men, and we have groups for women. And we have groups for almost everything under the sun. We have lessons on Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesdays, and all through the week. If, if you need help connecting, call us. Our minister of discipleship, Josh, would be happy to help you get connected. And if you're thinking, well, I've got this great idea for a small group. You know what I'm going to say to that? Yes! I can imagine... 
Dan, a small group of folks who ride bicycles on the Greenway. I can imagine that. I can imagine folks who are like me, 54 years old, who, who, who like to go walking. Did you hear me say walking? That's a combination of walking and jogging, walking. And I can imagine us getting together on a Saturday morning and doing that together. I can even imagine the scripture that I would read before we left because everything would have a scripture and a prayer. I can imagine that, right? Well, you're asking, what's the scripture? Let us run with perseverance, the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. I don't know what you find for a, for a bicycle passage, but we'll find you one, right? <clears throat> I just want to ask you to join me in making following Jesus a priority this year. I don't want you to be a fan of Jesus. I don't want you to know about Jesus. I want you to say with Paul, I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection. And I want you to follow close enough that you can hear the flip and the flop of his sandals. Because, choir, would you help me? I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back.